lot of people, if you ask them enough questions, you can find a moment when they had an experience of awe as a child, which something made them want to be a scientist. I had several. I was very, very interested in animals as a child, and I remember one of the things that fascinated me was homing pigeons. I used to go with my father to the local railway sidings where every Saturday morning hundreds of baskets of pigeons came from all over England and the porters at the station at a fixed time they'd take out their pocket watch at the right time they'd release them, they'd open these pigeons and fly up into the sky head off in all different directions all over Britain and I used to help them open these baskets and release these pigeons and I was just fascinated by the birds themselves and how they found their way I think, though, when people get absorbed in writing grant applications and in day-to-day -day life in the laboratory, or recedes into the background, and there's something in the spirit of modern science which, on the one hand, has opened up whole new perspectives for wonder, but there's something about the spirit in which it's done that rather diminishes wonder, you know, it says so all that stuff's just sort of stuff in the past, we've now figured it out. Mm -hmm. As soon as you think, we're so clever because we've figured it all out, it does have an awe diminishing effect. And instead of a recognition of that greater interconnectedness, which I think the mystic state is about, it's about a feeling of connection to something greater than oneself, not just an idea, but an experience of that connection. Um, I think that for many practicing scientists that doesn't happen very much on a daily basis in the lab, but maybe it doesn't happen very much on a daily basis for most people. Well, I think it's true that the, uh, our capacity for awe, I think, is uh, perhaps the greatest when we're young, hmm. and that uh, gradually with the onslaught of uh, responsibilities, problem solving, education, and uh, often, unfortunately, religion, uh, that, that childlike capacity in us hmm. gets somewhat squelched. I mean, thoughts about what we were talking about earlier, but not so many about fun. I don't want to go back, necessarily. Well, what is your well, conclusion after all that has been discussed the last two hours, for instance, about consciousness? Well, it's just that the starting with this, uh, starting, and we got into the whole thing about internalization, machine metaphors, breaking down into little bits. And my feeling is, you see, that there's a that we're leaving huge set things out of the puzzle. They may or may not be related to these, uh, the magic tissue or wonder tissue of quantum theory, which I, I liked very much what you said, Freeman, about you know, Dan may not want it in biology, but physicists deal with it all the time. Um, and my own feeling is that there are huge areas we don't understand about human and animal behavior, implying forms of interconnection and... Um, causal factors, maybe physical principles, that we haven't yet taken on board. And we're, we're just not going to get anywhere solving this like a jigsaw puzzle with several missing pieces. However long we go on, we're not going to solve it. So my approach is to try and find what these areas might be and design experiments where one could find out more about them. One area, let me just mention one, in the realm of animal behavior, namely the homing of pigeons. Now, nobody knows how pigeons do it. And every seemingly reasonable hypothesis is being tested to destruction. Um, 
we're now in a position where it's just, it, this seems, I think the, the evidence points to the, there being some completely unknown means by which they do it. Some form of connection between the pigeon and its home that we haven't taken on board in our model making. Don't about like the evidence behavior. of yeah. magnetic particles in the, yes. in the Well, this is what's satisfied. It's a pabulum for the last 20 years, magnetism. For the magnetic particles may exist in the head. The pigeons may be able to measure the dip of the magnetic displacement. You know, you displace them north, the needle may, of the compass may dip. Can, yeah. Move them due east or due west, the dip's exactly the same. The magnet won't help them in the slightest even if they've got one. And How do you know they're working only on dip? This, well, even yeah. if, if they have a compass, if it's a compass... Maybe it's a compass. All right, give, them a, give you a compass, parachute you into some unknown area. You've got your compass, can you get home? I can get close enough to home until I pick up other signals, which is apparently... Can you, without a map? Oh, I have to know where I am relative to oh, where I've been. Of course, that's, that's the that. problem. Well, How do you know where you are relative to home? Because you've migrated <laughs> there once before. No, I, don't, I, I doubt you could just take a pigeon in an airplane and drop a parachute randomly somewhere. But if you're you talking can, about... You can, you oh, can. This really? was done in the first? Second World yeah. War, yes. In the Second World War, pigeons were taken routinely on Lancaster bombers. Um, from the, the British um, Royal Air Force Pigeon Corps that's supplied that's these that's um, that's pigeons. They were taken on Lancaster bombers. And the, the idea was if they were ditched in the North Sea on the way back from a sortie in Germany, uh, then the, the navigator would release the map reference. They'd put tie it onto the pigeon's net and let it go in case radio contact was broken. Thousands of lives were saved by these pigeons. Some were released in the middle of the night in freezing fog, a hundred miles from land, and they got home. The, the really outstanding ones were awarded medals, and the <laughs> record of these can be found in an amazing book called Pigeons in Two World Wars by Colonel Osman. And um, the, the meritorious performance list has about 500 examples of astonishing feats. They were literally dropped out of planes in the middle of the night, sometimes in the middle of the winter, in freezing fog, and they got home the next morning, and lives were Suppose saved. that you had a very simple strategy, that you flip a coin, and you either s uh, fly due west or due east until you hit land. And, and uh, so half of them then will, 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 will come, uh, would come west and would, would, would ar arrive at England, and the other half would arrive in the Netherlands. You have to record the ones that don't make it, which is... But they, yes, and the point is... They do. They, 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 first of all, they observe the vanishing the direction. They the point is the ones that make it get the medals, and the other ones you forget about. But in experiments, there have been hundreds of experiments done. You see, every one of these ideas has been tested by serious researchers over long periods. And cloudy days, you know, they've been released on cloudy days. They've been released with their time clock shifted six hours or 12 hours by keeping them in artificially displaced day lengths for weeks. All these pigeons can home. They can home with magnets strapped on their wings or with Helmholtz co coils over their heads. Um, with blindfolds on? Yes, frosted glass contact lenses. They've been released up to 200 miles away, and they flop down within a quarter of a mile of the loft. Many of them uh, mm -hmm. collide with telegraph poles near the loft, but they, most of them get home to the home regions. And I have a pigeon loft in Britain. And the, the key experiment, you see, all these theories, you know, they see landmarks, the frosted glass contact lenses rule it out, the cloudy days, the time shift, the magnets on their wings. The, every one of these seemingly reasonably remember the way out on the, ho on, on the journey. That's been tested with pigeons anaesthetized, taken in rotating drums by incredibly devious routes. <laughs> when they come round, you release them, they fly straight home. Well, all these theories have been tested. There's been years of research. Factory, is there, is there yes, they've had their nostrils blocked up with wax. They get home. They've had uh, confusing <laughs> poor, poor smells poor. like turpentine put on their beaks. They get home. Oh, and just in case that doesn't work, they've had their olfactory nerves severed. Anosmic pigeons. Those get home. If they, uh, some don't fly at all. Cause but if you use then to overcome the idea of non-specific trauma. They've had xylocaine sprayed on their nasal mucosa, a local anesthetic. Those pigeons home straight off with no delay. All the, it's a fascinating literature. For 30, 50 years, 100 years, Charles Darwin suggested the idea that in his paper in Nature in 1873 on the origin of instincts that they remember the way out. And that was the first theory to be tested. 
every seemingly rational theory has been tested and tested and tested. And we've now reached a point where all of these have failed. We're in the realm of epicycles now. People are saying, oh, well, it's not any one of these in particular, but knock out two or three, and the others somehow take over in an unspecified combination. Now, my experiment is designed to test this theory to see, I think there's an unknown factor involved. I don't know what it is, but I think the pigeons are somehow linked to their home.